Um, yep, got that here. Um, so if there are any questions in between, um, definitely put them in the chat and I'll uh, try to get to it at the, uh, at the end probably. Um, um, so uh, again, thank you all for, for being here from all around the world. My name is uh, uh, Pim Bellinga. Uh, I am um, now uh, live from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and in this coming 20 minutes, I'll uh, uh, share briefly with you some of the stories um, that we see from our perspective from Grasswolf with, uh, with all the universities and schools that we work with. Um, and uh, I'll probably breeze through it. Um, uh, so let's see where we'll get. But the main takeaway, I think, is that uh, we sort of try to uh, summarize all of the experience that we saw in sort of seven patterns of collaboration uh, on how we see institutions working together. Um, and of course, I'm very um, uh, interested to see if you actually sort of recognize these and if they sort of match your experiences and your views. Um, and the idea is that being aware would help sharing best practices um, uh, so that you could sort of match your situation uh, with others. Um, and in this talk, I would like to uh, uh, focus uh, on certain resources because of course there are all kinds of resources and open resources. Um, uh, but the one that in this talk I would like to focus on are exercises, online interactive exercises. Um, and the question is then, sort of how do educators from different institutions collaboratively uh, create and curate uh, these open resources, these open exercises? Um, from, of course, so our view uh, from Graspol. So just real brief introduction. Um, uh, uh, I'm from Graspol, a social enterprise uh, also based here in the Netherlands. Um, uh, the name is a merger of two words, to grapple, to struggle, and to grasp, to understand. So we hope to help students get from one uh, to the other, and, and we're very happy to uh, to have been, uh, and, and now th since this year, a member of OE Global, but also uh, in the past years, uh, um, sort of following all the great work that everybody is, is doing on the open education uh, field. Um, I started a few years ago as a teacher, statistics teacher, um, and I wanted more time to do interactive things. Um, and that meant that I uh, wanted to use exercises so that students could really practice the basics uh, by themselves in their own time and pace. Um, but what I found is uh, that meant that I either had to create a lot of exercises myself uh, or um, uh, use a uh, well, often copyrighted uh, publisher. And I really didn't want to do that for my students because it was a crash course. It was a very brief course. Um, but then I was stuck a little bit because, um, uh, yeah, I was sort of stuck in, in, in between these two things. Um, and what I noticed is that actually a lot of other colleagues had the same thing. Um, so what I noticed is there were a lot of great things happening. There were a lot of people creating wonderful resources, but it was not really shared. And um, uh, that sort of got me uh, uh, together with uh, my co-founder Thijs and the rest of our team to, to sort of embark on this mission to make education more accessible and personal for everyone, um, especially for statistics and mathematics, um, as that was the course that I was teaching and to help build on each other's contributions. Um, so that's when we started Graspel, a collaborative practice assessment and editor platform for open exercises on math and statistics. Um, and so real brief, you can collaborate, edit, uh, you can select a lot of exercises and create them into different courses uh, so that students can, can practice and get personal feedback. And in the end, as a teacher, um, you can also get the insights and see if students actually master those topics and then sort of use your, your precious time to focus on the things that they really struggle with. Um, and a lot of those exercises is, uh, are also created by us and they're shared under a Creative Commons license uh, out in the open with no need to log in. So if you go to graspol.com slash open, uh, you can just uh, access them and we're, we're still sort of publishing more. Uh, and we're very um, uh, pleased and, and proud, I think, to, to receive the OER Collection Awards uh, a previous year. Um, now we're not only uh, sort of uh, uh, dedicated to open in our own platform, but we also really want to make sure that it's actually interoperable. Um, so just just a sort of a brief, brief plug um, that we're also uh, hosting an asynchronous action lab. Um, so to try to form a standard for uh, um, these exercises that they can actually be shared uh, between programs so that so that it's really open, uh, not only now, but also in the future. Um, and sort of with doing that, we have uh, now have uh, 25 million answers by 51,000 students on those exercises by a lot of different uh, organizations. Um, and it's those organizations and their experiences that I would like uh, to focus on. Their examples that at least we see in the field. Um, and uh, to summarize that 
um, into uh, seven patterns. And these are the seven patterns visualized. And um, uh, of course, I'll explain uh, briefly what they are. Uh, but maybe first, uh, um, uh, the idea is being aware of these, per uh, of these patterns will hopefully help sharing best practices and experiences uh, between organizations. Um, a clarification of the symbols. Um, so uh, uh, the, the square is an organization, um, the blue circle an instructor, the green dotted circle a student, the hexagon a supporting staff or team, and um, uh, the arrows are, are there either sort of the reuse or the publishing of exercises. Um, and what we encountered is often a first step is just informal sharing. You have colleagues, maybe at different institutions, um, they created some exercises, um, and they're, they're interested. Are there maybe other people who have also created exercises that I can maybe use their exercises? I'm open to sharing if people would like to use it. Um, and so then often what we try to do is actually bring these people together, um, sort of yeah, work as a sort of a liaison um, to bring these often disconnected uh, efforts uh, together. Um, but often that, that, may, that may sort of stay, uh, um, yeah, often informal. So that's one of the first patterns that we see, informal sharing. The next pattern um, is one that we encountered at Utrecht University, for example. So it's uh, quite a big university in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, a few years ago, the, uh, the methods department started collaborating uh, due to a big curriculum change. Um, and they actually created a lot of resources. Um, and uh, what we saw there is uh, it was sort of an, a community internal. Um, so there are a lot of teachers all creating exercises, uh, reusing exercises from each other, curating uh, their own exercises. So it's really an internal community. Um, at least at that time, there was not really being a lot of uh, a collaboration with other uh, communities yet, um, uh, but definitely internally, this was a strong community uh, creating and reusing exercise, for example, that we created, uh, but they also added a, a lot of the things uh, um, uh, actually to the to repositories began because everything they created, they also shared openly. Then the third one uh, we see at the DTU Delft. Uh, it's a technical university. They really have in their vision open education. Of course, they also co-host um, uh, this conference. Um, and the thing that here I would like to point to is their mathematics education, where they have a, a special team, the Project Innovation Mathematics Education. Um, and what that team does is they create a lot of resources. So for example, last year, they, they released a lot of linear algebra exercises. Uh, they created those and then uh, already uh, released them out into the open. Um, uh, so everybody can use it, uh, but they also create a lot of uh, now sort of really, uh, I would say value added videos um, uh, with then questions that students can practice interactively. Um, and so what you see there is the team really, folk, uh, I, I would say works as a sort of an in-house open education resources publisher. So they really do a lot of the, the production work so that other teachers can actually use that work. Um, and uh, um, I think this is a really interesting pattern to see uh, because uh, I think that can really sort of enhance and add to the quality of the open resources. Um, and that leads us to the fourth uh, example. And that is uh, at a different uh, university in the Netherlands at um, the University of Twente. Um, and here I would like to focus on their modularized math courses for all technical students. Um, uh, because what they did, they recently switched from a commercial copyright publisher to open educational resources. Um, but they, they did sort of struggle because um, uh, they didn't have the time to invest to sort of curate and filter all of the open uh, educational resources. Um, and so then um, uh, they asked us to, to sort of function as an, uh, you would call it external uh, uh, open publisher, where we actually did a lot of the curation and the filtering and, and the selection. Um, so that we could uh, create a sort of ready to use uh, uh, a package uh, of open educational resources at the same quality and the same, um, uh, yeah, same broadness as uh, a copyright publishers would do, but then open so that um, they could also build on top of that and that they could also edit everything so they would actually have more control. Um, and uh, uh, this is sort of the fourth pattern that we see. It's again, a sort of an, an, uh, a production team uh, but now externally, um, and uh, uh, I, wh what I'm very happy about is that we now actually see that it's exercises created by the TU Delft that are now being uh, filtered. Uh, a selection of that is being used at Twente. Uh, they're now adding new exercises, and those are shared back again to Delft. So now we actually 
uh, have these things mingling and actually um, these communities uh, uh, touching and sharing more uh, exercises. And, and that sharing between institutions uh, leads me to the fifth uh, pattern, um, uh, because here we see uh, um, uh, four universities, departments from four years universities, are uh, working together to create one public uh, repository of statistics exercise, and that's the Share Stats Project. It's a government subsidized uh, a big project by SURF. It's hosted. Um, and uh, what we there see is a, a really a formal community of practice. So now we have different communities at different institutions really formally uh, collaborating, um, sharing all their work. Um, it's a two, maybe even three year project, um, and uh, it's very structured and all of the resources that they then curate together uh, are being shared and published um, sort of in batches. Um, uh, uh, so that's really the fifth type of pattern uh, that we see. It's a formal collaboration between communities. And then the last two. Um, uh, so uh, I think the sixth one that we see is a student driven curation. So um, yeah, it's, it's not exactly the same as collaboration, but I did want to highlight it. Um, so I, I know this was happening at some medical uh, faculties where they said there are so many um, open educational resources, but, but it's really hard to estimate the quality. Uh, and then they actually asked a lot of students to help them uh, with curating that uh, sort of very broad selection into a into a more uh, specific selection. And then actually that was uh, being um, uh, sort of shared with, um, with the instructors um, so that they could do the last curation, really uh, go into the sort of the topical quality of the, uh, of the exercises. And, and then that selection again was shared outside so that it's actually a lot of value add um, that was being brought from there. Um, so here, there's not a lot of uh, collaboration between uh, universities, uh, but it's, it's really the students who, who are really helping here. Um, uh, but here, the students really still had a sort of more uh, only a curation effort. Um, what I'm uh, really excited about uh, to see happening, and of course, this really ties, I think, into the open pedagogy um, uh, movement also, um, is something that is happening here at the, the Hogeschool of Amsterdam, so right here in the city. Um, uh, the focus here is on a course for future mathematics teachers, um, because there is now a, a pilot going on um, where it's student-driven creation. So actually students create a lot of exercises, the same thing they'll have to do uh, uh, when they uh, become an instructor. Uh, they peer review them, uh, share them, see what works, and then sort of the, the good quality ones um, uh, can then later on be shared internally again, uh, or also externally to help people uh, practice. Um, so this is really um, where it's the students who do the collaboration um, and, uh, and then sharing it again. Um, so those were the seven patterns. It's, uh, it's, uh, it went by very fast. Um, uh, but I hope that being aware and, and seeing the patterns like this helps sharing sort of best practices and, uh, and experience uh, to see sort of if, if you actually have the same kind of collaboration. Um, and so the first question would be uh, sort of uh, question 1A, uh, are there more patterns? I'm really interested to see if, uh, if you see other patterns in, in your institutions. Um, and uh, maybe a second question is, um, is there a pattern that actually matches the way that you collaborate? So um, maybe that would be an interesting one to, to uh, go into uh, the chat and to see if there are people who think that they uh, see more patterns um, or if there are patterns that actually match the way that you collaborate uh, with your colleagues. Um, and then as a sort of a final uh, note or insight from us, um, is that uh, we really see an interesting role for these OER publishers, whether they're in-house or external, um, because we think it really helps um, uh, teachers who, who don't have a lot of time often because they have so much to do, and it really helps them switching from copyrighted resources to open resources. Um, and then that can really help um, to then sort of build on from their um, uh, uh, collaboration once they sort of have that first um, a set or selection of materials ready so that they can actually sort of do their normal um, uh, instruction and then uh, edit or adapt these materials and then start sharing uh, by themselves. Uh, and I think this is really interesting. And then we really get this, this movement from disconnected efforts into building on, uh, uh, on top of each other's efforts. Um, so uh, let's work together to make education more accessible and personal. And I know you're already doing that, um, but let's see if we can um, sort of connect our efforts more uh, and contribute uh, to that. So thank you, uh, OE Global. 
um, uh, uh, a last shout out. So if you want to contribute your input also to an open format so that uh, exercises that are being created in different applications can be more easily shared, um, please visit our open format workshop. Uh, and finally, if, um, if you want to see the uh, resources, go to uh, graspl.com slash open. Um, if you want to connect on Twitter um, at open graspl. But for now, let's move to the chat and see um, if these patterns actually match, uh, and uh, if there are patterns that you that actually fit the way that you collaborate. Thank you. <laughs> wow, this is great, Pim. I really love the notion of patterns, and I put that question into chat: which patterns match how you collaborate? We do have a couple of minutes. Does anyone in the participant group want to? make some comments related to this notion of patterns and which ones seem to work for you. Um, you're welcome to grab the mic and speak directly. Silence. <laughs> I think people it's, it's are- It's always the awkward, the awkward yeah. <laughs> silent moments when nobody knows if they should speak. But I, I'm really interested to hear, uh, Paul, do, do these, um, uh, do, do you see other patterns in, in collaboration? Because of course you also see a lot of different uh, collaboration between institutions all around the world. Are, are there different ways that, um, that you see people connecting or collaborating? Yeah, uh, well, I guess I'll just say this, and that is that I've never conceived of this idea before of like patterns of connection and those kind of representing kind of best practices. And so, I, I will say that it's got me thinking now, Pim, and I'll be uh, kind of examining what I see happening in the global context from this particular lens. Uh, I'm also very keen to kind of um, get a sense of, it's like some of these patterns are what I'll call uh, micro ecosystems to relate to something I was part of yesterday, you know, where it's happening within a kind of very regional uh, uh, context and then, yep. You know, to what extent will that pattern then be the same or different when you move beyond that kind of micro ecosystem to something more macro where you're engaging other countries, let's say. Um, and um, I don't know, yeah, it's been just very thought provoking. So I, it's one of the more, it's been really fascinating. Um, and Robert has mentioned patterns where non-university professionals are sharing that's interesting too. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I guess we'll have to stop here, Pim, but I'll just say yeah. thank you so much for this very intriguing idea and very fascinating way to represent sharing. I think it's a powerful, thank you. Thank you, Paul, and uh, all the attendees, of course, <laughs> thank you all for your, uh, your attention and time. <laughs>